Our first plenary speaker today is Mr. Jonah Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg is the ASNIS Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. He is also a fellow at the National Review Institute. In 2019, he left his role as senior editor at, of National Review Magazine after a 21 year stint with the publication to start a new venture with fellow journalist Steve Hayes. He has been a weekly columnist for the Los Angeles Times since 2005 and a nationally syndicated columnist since 2000. He hosts the popular podcast Remnant with Jonah Goldberg and his most recent book, which we're going to learn about today, is Suicide of the West, How the Rebirth of Tribalism, Populism, Nationalism, and Identity Politics is Destroying American Democracy, which was a New York Times bestseller in 2018. Now we'll be selling his book out in the hall during the break, and Jonah will be available to sign your books if you would like. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Jonah Goldberg. Uh, it's absolutely great to be here. Um, I drove down to Washington yesterday and uh, picked the best time of year to possibly do that. Um, so it was interesting, the whole conference began with this best of times, worst of times, uh, Dickens thing, which is one of my favorite passages. And it, it reminds me of uh, this moment when uh, Boris Yeltsin, when he was still the president of Russia, he was asked uh, by a journalist if he could summarize the state of the Russian economy in one word. And Yeltsin said, good. <laughs> the journalist said, all right. Could you describe it in two words? And he said, not good. <laughs> um, and uh, that's sort of where we are these days. You know, I wrote a book called Suicide of the West, and a lot of my friends on the right, longtime eggheady intellectual friends, uh, their major criticism of the book was that it was uh, too upbeat and too optimistic. And I was like, it was called Suicide of the West. I mean, I, I could have called it, you know, take a bath with a toaster or something, but I thought you know, there, was, there was some nuance to it. Um, so anyway, I, I'm not gonna do my full book talk because one, I wanna get to Q&A, two, I wanna address sort of some of the themes that you guys are dealing with, um, and, uh, um, and three, we don't need to talk very much about some of the things I normally talk about. Uh, so as Henry VIII said to each of his wives, I won't keep you long. Um, <laughs> so, one, of, one of my weird, of my many weird obsessions is I like to ask, uh, I know it's interesting watching that video about the changes over the last hundred years and all that. One of the things, uh, I, a little of mental exercises I like to do is imagine someone from 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago looking at the world around us today and asking not what would be different to them, but what would be the same? What would be recognizable to them even now? Um, and once you start playing this game, it gets, gets really kind of interesting really quickly, and I'll explain why in a second. But one of the examples I almost always use is North Korea. Now, if you, if, if you go by what the, how the press and intellectuals generally talk about North Korea, it's described as a communist or a Stalinist or maybe sometimes an authoritarian regime, Marxist regime and all that kind of stuff. The problem with that is that in all of the state propaganda, all the textbooks, all of the literature, uh, manifestos and constitutions and all that nonsense, uh, they yank down all references to Marxism or Stalinism or any of that kind of stuff decades ago. None of it is in there. The reality is, is that, that North Korea is, would be utterly recognizable from someone in Hammurabi's time. It is uh, essentially uh, a divine right of kings country. Instead of, well, it's not quite divine right of kings, it's more like divine right of kings. Um, but it's a hereditarily ruled country for three generations now. State 
propaganda is involved in all sorts of wild-eyed myth-making about how, uh, you know, when Kim Jong-un was born, the you know, night turned to day, and there were rainbows and unicorns and all these great things. Uh, Kim Jong-un's father, which I think I was eel, right? Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, he, he's, he, the way they describe him, it's basically like Dr. Evil from the Austin Powers. I mean, the guy claimed to invent the hamburger uh, of the, of, for Kim Jong-un of the 19, uh, of the 20 greatest symphonies that have ever been written in the world. He wrote 20 of them. Uh, they say that he doesn't need a bathroom, his body is so efficient. Um, if you Google image search his body, uh, it is not the body that would immediately come to mind as like the most efficient body in the world. Um, but the, and moreover, it's not just a, it's a hereditary rule. Uh, the society is, it's a class-driven society. They have essentially uh, peasant class, they have um, an aristocracy. If you were a descendant of the people who collaborated with the Japanese, you can never rise above the level of serf and essentially slave labor. If you are the children of the revolutionary elite class, you are born with more privileges than other people. And this sort of system would be utterly recognizable to people throughout most of history. And so the reason why I bring that up is because I am obsessed with the idea that human nature has no history. So where I begin the book is I sort of ask the reader, I borrow this thought experiment from Guy Neal. Imagine you're an alien from another planet, and you are um, tasked with monitoring the progress of Homo sapiens on this <laughs> obscure planet Earth. And um, let's say you start when we split off from the Neanderthals. When I say split off, what I really mean is after we wiped out the last of them. And to be honest, they have but uh, let's say we did this 250,000 years ago, okay? You're only allowed to visit once every 10,000 years. So you take really copious notes on every visit. So on your first visit, when you look down, you look at Homo sapiens, uh, probably in Africa at the time, because that's where all human beings come from, what would you, uh, you write in your notes? You'd write, semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food. That's about it. You come back in 10,000 years, what would you write? Semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food, no change. Come back in 10,000 years, what would you write? Semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food, no change. You would do that, and there'd be some changes, some migration changes and changes in diet, but for the most part, no changes. No changes that we would associate with advances of culture or technology or any of these kinds of things. You would do this 23 times, sending hairless apes forging and fighting for food, no change. On your 24th time, you would see some amazing changes. You would see the emergence of the first city-states, which were brought about by the emergence of agriculture. You would see the emergence of some metallurgy and some really fetching clay pots, right? It would be huge. Can't wait to come back for your 25th visit after 250,000 years. So your, your ship starts to pull up into orbit, but before you even get into orbit, your, your ship would be spotted by Norman. Um, you might get here just in time to see, I don't know, like Miley Cyrus twerking at the Super Bowl. <laughs> what I mean by this is that virtually everything that we associate with human progress happened in the last 10,000 years. Um, and but then even this is a little misleading. Because it's sort of like me saying the combined net worth of Jonah Goldberg and Jeff Bezos exceeds $120 billion. <laughs> it's true, but I'm like around here. Because in reality, almost everything that we associate with human progress has happened in the last 300 years. For 250,000 years, everywhere in the world, ancient Rome, ancient China, ancient Africa, North America, South America, Europe, doesn't matter. Everywhere in the world, the average human being lived on no more than $3 a day for 7,500 generations. And then once, and only once, in all of human history did that start to change. I argue, as a lot of other people do, that it started in England. There are people who say it started in Holland, and if there are any Dutch jingoists in the room, we can have that conversation later. But regardless, it happens about 300 years ago, it starts to go like this, and like this. And it's been going like that ever since. Right in this moment, we live in the greatest moment of poverty alleviation in all of human history. 
hundreds of millions, billions of people are being lifted out of poverty. The, uh, the UN is uh, planning on uh, expecting to get rid of the designation of extreme poverty within a decade because there won't be people left in extreme poverty to measure. That is astounding. Why did it happen? Well, it wasn't because of the UN. The UN does nice things, but the reason why it happened is this, these ideas that emerged by accident in England or Hong Kong um, in the 70, late 1600s, early 1700s change the civilization because all a civilization is is a story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Who are we? That is what a civilization is. And for this weird, quirky moment that emerges because of the weirdness of British culture, it became all of a sudden good to celebrate the rights of the individual. I call it the Lockean Revolution. It's this idea that our rights come from God, not from government, that we are citizens, not subjects. Uh, we own ourselves, we are captains of ourselves, as Locke put it, and therefore the fruits of our labors belong to us, which means that innovation is a good thing. For almost all of human history, innovation, so at least since the agricultural revolution, innovation was uh, crushed by elites, just as it's sort of crushed in North Korea today. Because innovation, however you want to define it, is a threat to the established order. So the Chinese and the Arabs were way ahead of Western Europe for centuries upon centuries. But the second that innovation started to threaten the ruling class, the ruling class smashed innovation. In Western Europe, innovation was literally a sin. The sin of questioning the established or order, curiosities. And then there's this weird moment, for complicated reasons, we can maybe get into a Q&A if you want, this genie escapes the bottle in England and in Holland and starts spreading around the world that says, no, innovation is a good thing. That uh, you know, these sort of bourgeois values are a good thing. That making money and uh, you know, being in charge of yourself is a good thing. And it changed the world. But it happened in a blink of an eye. Which gets me to sort of the main point I want to talk about today. One of the takeaways of my argument is, is that democracy is unnatural. Capitalism, and let me be very clear, what has two thumbs and loves capitalism? This guy. But capitalism is unnatural. Human rights are unnatural. If they were natural, they would have showed up a little earlier in the evolutionary record. Think of it this way. Like, say you have a jar of ants, and you go to some planet or some island that has no ants. You dump the ants out on the ground. What will the ants do? They'll start taking tunnels. They'll anoint the queen. I don't know. I'm not an entomologist. We'll do ant stuff, right? <laughs> Similarly, if you can take human beings shorn of their education and their civilizational awareness in their raw form and put them on some island, what would they do? Well, they wouldn't start creating apps on their iPhone to deliver you weed faster, right? <laughs> They would turn into what essentially semi hairless apes foraging and fighting for food. That's the story of like Lord of the Flies, right? You take these pinnacles of Western civilization, these, these snot nosed British boarding school kids, you dump them on an island without adult supervision. 20 minutes later, they got war paint and spears and they're running around. They anoint a sort of demon god named Beelzebub, which translates as Lord of the Flies. That's what, uh, what's one of the reasons I love all apoc apocalyptic fiction and sci fi. Is because the second the thin veneer of civilization goes away, people revert back to bands and tribes where they defend themselves. That's what The Walking Dead is about. That's what you know, uh, the Mad Max movies are about. Because that is, that is our natural programming reasserting itself in a time of crisis. And so, I'm sorry I'm drinking so much water. I smoked an enormous amount of pot before I got here and I get, I get dry now. Um, <laughs> So, when I say that human nature has no history, I've been telling that joke for years, I'm always waiting for the audience to be really mad about it. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, uh, when, when you talk about human, human nature having no history, that's what I mean. 
right? There's this wonderful line from Hannah Arendt, one of my favorite intellectuals, who says, every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children. <laughs> and it is absolutely true. If you took a baby from New Rochelle or uh, Tacoma Park or someplace like you know, or Santa Monica, some hippie place, right? And you sent them back a thousand years to a Viking village and they got adopted rather than eaten or something, right? Sent it back to a Viking village and it got adopted. You know what it would do when it grew up? Rape and pillage the English countryside. <laughs> if you took a Viking baby and you sent it to New Rochelle and it got adopted, it'd grow up to be an orthodontist. Right? And so, this brings me to uh, uh, this argument about disruption. In my book, I write a lot about corruption. Um, there's a similarity in the words, too, when you think about it. And uh, philosophically, theologically, uh, etymologically, uh, corruption is a really fascinating word. Today, it just means graft, bribery, right? Uh, uh, asking the Ukrainian president to do something he shouldn't do, whatever. Uh, uh, but historically, it had a much richer meaning. It meant decay, entropy, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Um, this idea that um, from the second law of thermodynamics, because any system that is not maintained will, will basically fall apart. The idea that rust never sleeps. Um, if you have, uh, the Roman poet uh, Horace has this line, he says, you can chase nature out with a pitchfork, it will always come rushing back in. And, um, and this is something like, if you, ever, if you don't know anybody who's ever owned a boat, you know that if you don't maintain it, nature will take it from you pretty quickly. If you put an outhouse and a beautiful grandfather clock in the field, the termites won't care that one is much more valuable than the other. Nature reclaims what is hers. And so part of my argument is that is true of human nature too. Human nature is something that we have to, we have to be on, recognize, be on guard about. It is something that didn't come up in the, the test, the, the challenges for leaders out there, but it is ultimately the greatest challenge for leaders, because it is the permanent challenge for leaders. It is natural, in, it, it, it's part of our wiring in a state where you think you might die, to run away. Right? It is natural to be afraid of things. It is natural to want vengeance for fallen comrades and do terrible things to people. And one of the things that leaders do is they channel and harness and restrain human nature in ways that are in accordance with ethics and law and morality. And that is a permanent challenge for leaders for all time, in all situations, forever. And so I want to talk about the role of institutions. Uh, which I don't normally talk about in the book talk, but I think it's a really important thing. Historically, and so let me put it this way. Economists, talk, when they talk about institutions, they basically just mean rules. Um, the rule of law, property rights. These are rules that don't have buildings around them. And then more, normal people, when they talk about institutions, they generally talk about places like VMI, right? Or they talk about um, uh, bowling leagues, or they talk about churches, right? These are things that have a physical manifestation, but they're also a way for people to organize around the principle. Both things are, both definitions are fine by me. For a very long time, the classic role of an institution was to bend human nature towards a goal. Right, so before when I talk about how every generation of Western civilization is invaded by barbarians, we call them children. I mean that quite seriously. You are born into a little civilization, a little institution called the family. And the family sets rules for you. It models behavior. It sets expectations. It takes you from like, anybody who's had a kid, and there are some people in this room who've had kids, knows that when babies come into this world, they are not blank slates. Rousseau was wrong about that, so was Locke. They come into the world with a whole bunch of factory preset programming, but they need updates. And so your introduction to civilization, civilization 
is, is a verb, civilizing. It's the process of taking these little adorable barbarians <laughs> and turning them into citizens. And that starts in families, but that's not the only institution that does that. Churches, schools, all of these local communities, bowling leagues, little leagues, the Boy Scouts. The classic example of an institution that shapes character is like the Marines. Right? You go in a damn hippie and come out a Marine. <laughs> and there's a reason why in this culture today, there's only one institution that has a majority of Americans expressing faith and confidence in. And it's the military. Because they understand that that's the role that they play, and they stay loyal to this idea of shaping characters for the better. And um, so, one of the things that's changed, one of the most disruptive things that's happened in our culture in the last 50 years, is people's understanding of institutions is subtly changing. People used to think that an institution was a place where you made sacrifices of your time, your energy, your desires for the greater good of that institution, and then that had not on effects for the greater good of the entire country. More and more people see institutions as platforms, stages to perform upon and to exploit, to extract fame and status from, rather than contribute to. So whatever you think about the, the the merits of Colin Kaepernick's decision to take a knee during the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, um, that's what he was doing. He was exploiting the NFL for his own agenda. And we can agree with the agenda or not, that's not what I'm trying to get at. Um, Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos, she wanted to be super famous like the next Steve Jobs, and so she fudged all the numbers and she ran a crooked operation for her company. You can look around all over the place, this sort of thing is happening at small levels and at big levels. Uh, the thing I normally talk about these days is politics, and you just look at the 2016 election. You had Donald Trump, never a Republican for most of his life, pro-choice, uh, pro-gun control, uh, had a thumbless grasp of the Constitution, all these various things, and he basically used the Republican Party, he had a hostile takeover of the Republican Party, and used the Republican Party for his own ends. Bernie Sanders, almost did the same thing with the Democratic Party. It's worth pointing out, you talk to any Democrats in Washington, they hate Bernie Sanders. For most of his life, he wasn't a Democrat, right? He was a, a self-described independent and a socialist. He was, he's a real, I mean, you may love his passion and all that kind of stuff, but this is a guy who literally, when I say literally, I don't mean figuratively the way Joe Biden says literally. Um, <laughs> a socialist commune, because all he wanted to do was talk about revolution rather than dig any ditches or do any work. And they're like, we gotta get rid of this guy, right? But he used the Democratic Party as a platform for his own agenda. And you can find this sort of thing all over us. Where does this come from? Well, part of the argument in my book is that the Romantic era, um, uh, which I'm not gonna bore you all when I wanna talk about paintings or Byron or poetry or any of that kind of stuff. But the Romantic era never ended. What was the Romantic era? It was basically, it's where nationalism comes from. Originally nationalism was actually called Romantic nationalism because that's what it was. It was a rebellion that starts in places like Germany against the French Enlightenment, the sort of abstract rules that constrain human nature, the abstract rules that constrain ethnic identity. And it said, and it said the, the uh, the real thing that drives human beings isn't reason, but passion, emotions. Now, the Romantic era ended, but this idea that we should all give in to our emotions and passions is, is healthier today than it was 300 years ago. We, as a culture, raise kids to believe that the highest source of moral authority is their own gut. Go with your instincts, go with your feelings, right? Be true to yourself. That's why you can have this rebellious attitude towards institutions, because the institution matters less than your own gut. That's why like, I despise with a blinding passion movies like Dead Poets. Uh, and uh, first of all, getting back to the family as an institution, it is literally the worst form of parenting to tell kids, go with your gut, right? Hey, I wouldn't run the 
scissors. But hey, you gotta be true to yourself. Go for it. I don't know, Timmy. That dog may not be friendly. I wouldn't pet it. But listen to your gut. You know, go with your passions. Give it a try. Right? That is like literally the worst thing. And um, but more and more, that's how we designate who heroes are. That's how we designate who our leaders are. Not how much they are willing to sacrifice for the greater good of their institutions or their country, but how much they're willing to speak their own personal truth, speak truth to power in a way that gets them fame or, or a YouTube channel or whatnot. And that is deeply corrosive to a culture and a society, and it's deeply dangerous. And so, I want to put it to you that the real challenge, as you can tell, I'm not really working from my notes here, but I think about this stuff a lot because I'm so cool. Um, the real challenge that we face as a society is the disruption, dissolution, or corruption of the institutions that give us meaning, of the institutions that make us feel like we're part of something larger than ourselves. That's why when I refer, when I referenced earlier how most institutions are um, um, below 50% in terms of faith and confidence in this country, that is true. It's true. Lawyers, doctors, engineers, churches, synagogues, Congress, obviously, um, uh, the presidency. You cannot name an institution. The police, every now and then, get slightly above 50%. But basically, every other, other institution in this country is under law. Church attendance is dying in this country for people under the age of 40. And part of my argument in my book is that um, we are born to want meaning, a sense of belonging. In a state of nature, we are born in a little band, a semi-hairless band, right, where everything is for the group, where the enemy is anybody who's not part of the group. Um, people say, oh, you have to teach people to hate. Nonsense. You have to teach people not to hate. That's what civilization does. Is it expands the definition of de decent and ethical behavior beyond your own primal instincts. So maybe there's some amazing work Paul Bloom and Yale is telling about. He has a wonderful book called Just Babies, where they measure the factory preset programming of babies when they come into the world. And they're full of them, right? And they have a moral sense. They are, it's, in fact, babies are born with accents when they cry. So French babies have a French accent when they cry, and Russian babies have a Russian accent when they cry. Um, they pick it up from listening in utero to the voices around them. And uh, it's not that babies are indoctrinated with any kind of like white supremacy or racism. They are, they are coming into the world with some programming that says people who don't look or sound or smell like my parents, I should be a little more scared of them. And you have to teach babies not to do that. That's part of being a humane person and good parents is teaching kids how to deal with strangers. That is the wonderful thing about the market. In a state of nature, if you have a bushel of apples and I want your apples, the way I get your apples is I hit you over the head with a rock and I take your apples. <laughs> In a market, the way you deal with a stranger who has apples is, is I give you money. He likes them. I like apples. It's win-win. And so one of the beautiful things about the rule of law, democracy, and all these things in the market is it helps you deal with strangers. But we are born with wiring that says strangers are scary. And it takes a civilization to work through that. The problem is, is that the institutions that civilize us are falling down on the job. They're not teaching ethics. They're not teaching morality. They're not teaching honorable behavior. This place may be an exception, an island of decency out there, but it's a problem in the larger culture. And so the problem is, is that when you do that, or when you fail to do that, your normal human wiring kicks back in. So yeah, no, we're not like, you know, dividing up into roving bands of marauders, right? But we, we've known this about human nature for a very long time. Whether it was the gangs of, you know, inner city New York or uh, ancient Rome or Crips and Bloods in LA in the 1980s. When you don't civilize particularly young men properly, they behave like young men have behaved for a very long time, like forever. 
And politically, what is happening is, because we are not socializing people into these institutions, where people don't feel like they belong some, to something close to home, they are turning to these abstract isms to find that sense of meaning and belonging that they can't get from a family or from a local institution or whatever. And that's why you get identity politics, that's how you get populism, that's how you get nationalism, that's how you get the totally screwed up nature of our politics today. Where people think that if they belong to this tribe or this party or whatever, and not the other one, that they're the good people and the other people are the bad. There's an amazing social science on this these days. The, the, your partisan affiliation is now more predictive of attitudes and behaviors towards other people than race, religion, or gender. That is unheard of in, in political science for the last 150 years. It is bizarre. Um, the levels of discrimination by Democrats against Republicans and by Republicans against Democrats dwarfs that of other forms of discrimination. That weird. That makes me want to cut. And, you know, it's like 40 years ago, if I asked you whether you were liberal or conservative, I would have to ask a follow-up question to find out whether you were a Democrat or a Republican. That's no longer the case. And the reason that's no longer the case is because we have this big sort, and people who are not finding meaning and belonging in their local communities are finding cheap meaning and belonging with, by joining these national coalitions. And the problem when you join politics at a national level is you end up treating strangers 3,000 3, miles away as abstractions rather than real human beings. And that is deeply poisonous to democracy. You know, uh, my wife had, my favorite New Yorker cartoon, my wife had it blown up and framed for me. And it has two dogs in suits drinking like martinis at a bar in Manhattan. And one dog says to the other dog, you know, it's not good enough that dogs succeed. Cats must also fail. <laughs> That's what our politics is like right now. And one of the reasons it's like that is because the two institutions that are most important for regulating our political attitudes, the political parties, have never been weaker. And so people internalize their politics as a kind of identity politics now. And, uh, and the, parties, the parties used to have this ability to manage expectations, this ability to protect their own interests over the long term, long term protect their own brand over the long term. Now they're basically just marketing slogans. And whoever manages to get the, the brass ring in one party or the other defines what the party stands for. That is a form of corruption. And it is a profound form of disruption. Because basically what is happening is that institutions like the Republican Party, like the Democratic Party, they are bending to the demands of, the pop of, 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 of populists. They're bending to the demands of popular passions rather than to any notice noticeable principle. And that is having a profound uh, stress. It's putting profound stress on a lot of our institutions on, from both sides. I'm a, I'm a critic of the current president, but you know we understand why the current president doesn't, uh, un, you know, care very much about constitutional norms and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't know a lot about that. What is Elizabeth Warren's excuse? Um, we have uh, we have people in the Democratic Party literally running on illegal and unconstitutional things constantly. And the rules, which are supposed to constrain human nature, which the Founding Fathers understood, right? It's supposed to constrain popular passions, are being viewed with contempt by both sides. And so it falls to people like the people in this room to understand, take into account human nature, but also understand that giving into human nature is, is the worst form of leadership. It's not leadership at all. It's rather radical. <clears throat> And a great number of our leaders on the left and the right these days they remind me of the French intellectual who said, the people have chosen, and I must go with them, for I am their leader. So the hero in the American political tradition isn't the mob. It's the man or woman who stands up to the mob. It's the man or woman who says, you're not going to lynch this guy. It's the man or the woman who says that one with the law on their side, or one with morality on their side, is a majority. And that sort of thing is being lost as people are pandering to the emotions of the public, pandering to their own emotions, and considering laws and rules of behavior to be other people's problems, not theirs. And 
that is, the, that is going to be the test for you, regardless of changes in technology going forward, regardless of all of these other things which are important, because human nature doesn't change. And it's the job of leaders to take that into account for all time. Thank you all very much. Questions. If you have a question, please come down to one of the microphones on each of the aisles so that we can all share in your question and go for a I know this is a disciplined bunch, so I normally I wouldn't have to say what I normally say, but I'll say it anyway. Please make your statements in the form of a question. Okay. Sometimes you get people who do 20 minute rambles about stuff. Where was the question? Good morning, sir. My name is Cadet Kineshny. Good morning. Um, my question is a little bit long, I sort of go into a statement beforehand, but... Sure. <laughs> so, your, uh, so your argument appears to be that the central mechanism of disruption we are currently seeing in the world is the degradation of institutions. My question is regarding the resurgence of populism in democracies across the world, which arguably is the single most significant internal threat to democracy. Since you claim democracy is an unnatural state, <clears throat> and therefore is a system presumed, presumably maintained by these institutions, is their decline revealing that the cure to problems like populism is strengthening of these institutions? If so, how can we go about strengthening them, and which ones in particular need to be strengthened? Sure. Yeah, so, um, not a big fan of populism. Uh, not a huge fan of democracy, to be brutally honest. I mean, let me be honest with you. We need democracy, but we fetishize democracy. Um, I like the Bill of Rights. Right? The Bill of Rights is anti-democratic. The Constitution, in a lot of ways, is anti or non-democratic, in the sense that it locks in some things and takes them out of the hands of voters, for the most part. Uh, very difficult to get a law that says you don't have a right to free speech. Very difficult to get a law that says you don't have the right to worship the God that you want to worship. That's not something we leave to voters. Pure democracy is simply the doctrine that says 51% um, of the people get to pee in the cornflakes of 49% of the people. I'm not in favor of that. But that at least is better than populism. Because at least democracy involves mechanisms and rules that show up and cast a ballot and all the rest. Populism just says any idea that is inconvenient any institution that is inconvenient to my will, to our, our will, to our desire, is illegitimate. It is anti-intellectual, it is anti-reason, it is anti-democratic. There's a great line from William Jennings Bryan, the famous 19th century populist leader, who said, the people of Nebraska are for free silver, therefore I am for free silver. I will look up the arguments later. I like arguments. I like debate and deliberation. That's what democracy is about. So to get to your question, um, one of the reasons why we have this resurgence of populism is that our institutions fail us. I mean, I'm not saying that people are wrong to have disregard for a lot of our institutions. Our elites have done a very bad job, not just in the United States, but across the West, at maintaining their legitimacy. They sort of have lost touch with the idea that maintaining the trust of the public is part of their job. And in the EU, where you've got all of these, you know, you know, pinstripe cookie pushers who like have meetings over clever cheese in hotel lobbies, they have utter disdain for their own people. Uh, and that's a real problem. And so a little populism is, managed, is good in the sense that it, it sort of recalibrates everyone to understand, my God, we've gotten way out ahead of our own people on this stuff. But at the same time, um, the problem is, is that that you need to regulate those sorts of passions. That's what the Founding Fathers intended by you know, the, the, the Senate and the House, right? The House is the most democratic branch, or the most democratic institution. Two, every two years, direct election of people. And then the Founding Fathers said, okay, you gotta take that passion that we get from the people, and then we'll have the Senate, which the famous metaphor is, it's the cooling saucer, where we pour that passion in there, and it becomes more deliberate. The problem is the way our system is set up, the way the mass media is set up, the way social media is set up, our media, our, our, everyone is trying to monetize outrage and anger. And uh, that is a real problem. How you fix that, I'm not sure. 
right? When I have ideas, I want to send power down to the most local level possible. There are all sorts of like egghead political science ideas. But first, you have to sort of recognize the problem. One of the reasons I, my friend Steve and I have started this media company is that we're so disgusted by the way so much the media works. So they're basically just trying to, what I often say, is monetize the dopamine hits. They make you really, really angry about something. So you'll click on something stupid. And uh, some of that is just going to require education of the public, education of young people, civics education about how this stuff is supposed to work, and a recalibration of our institutions that, at the local level, solve, deal with our problems where our problems actually exist. Because people don't live in the United States of America. They live in a neighborhood in Cleveland or a neighborhood in, in, in Muncie, and they Deal, they live with other human beings. They don't live with these pirates of the Caribbean animatronic abstractions that you get through social media and cable news. And until people start understanding that and learning that, we're going to have these problems for a while. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Sir, Jack Ewan from West Point. Uh, quick question. So I read recently in a political article that the baby boomer generation broke American democracy. <laughs> Can you please evaluate the statement? And if you agree with it, uh, how do we avoid those mistakes in the future? Sure. Okay. So, as a Gen Xer who despises generational stereotyping, I'm kind of torn about this. Um, first of all, a word about generational stereotyping. I know, like millennials, like they're as millennials or Gen Zers or whatever you call yourselves these days. Uh, all you kids are on my lawn. Uh, <laughs> I really dislike identity politics generally. I really hate generational identity politics. For example, I hate the phrase greatest generation. Hate it. If you stormed Normandy, you shouldn't have to buy yourself a beer for the rest of your life. Bully for you, you're a patriot, a hero, thank you for your service. If on D-Day, you were in a drunk tank in Peoria, why are you a member of the greatest generation? What, what, what's the transit of property that says a guy who risked his life to liberate Europe um, gave some of his glory to someone who didn't? I don't get it, right? And so there's a, we do this a lot because it's an easier way to understand it. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to the damage that the baby boomers did. In part for the themes that I'm talking about here, about this primacy of emotion. You had the World War II generation, which was very much about you know, being outer directed, service to others, service to the nation. Um, ask not what your country can do for you, but what, your country, what you can do for your country. The baby boomers come along, they can't live up to that model. And so instead, the new frontier for them was essentially their inner explorations. And if you read like the Port Huron Statement, which is this famous 50,000 word manifesto that launched the Students for Democratic Society and the protest movements of the 1960s, it's very much this sort of self-regarding, introspective, we're really pissed off that we don't have anything great to do, so we're gonna whine about it kind of thing. Um, but I should say, the greatest generation as a political matter has a lot to answer for too. Because of our gratitude to that generation, we have changed the rules to accommodate them for their entire lives. From the GI Bill, which I think is a perfectly defensible piece of legislation on its own, to all sorts of social security and entitlement changes, we kept sort of saying, These people, this generation is special. And then the baby boomers came in and compounded it. Um, and so I don't have, like, I didn't read the Politico article, but um, uh, I generally think that this turn towards using institutions as things to perform upon, uh, the baby boomers have a lot of responsibility for that. They're the ones who push a lot of the sort of, uh, you gotta listen to young people because they're passionate uh, stuff on the culture. They bent, the, they were the hostile to American culture in a way that no previous generation had been, except for maybe some of the, the flapper types in the 1920s. Um, uh, and that's had, and the way they raised their kids to sort of have the skepticism towards America and the country um, is, uh, is, is, is responsible for a lot of the problems. So I heard you mention um, some things about technology. Um, and I was wondering, because in our prior event, we were asked what was a, uh, a 
a problem with um, leadership today, and like what would be a large problem with leadership. And I, I was wondering what your thoughts were on how technology is a negative effect on leadership. Sure. Um, so it's funny. Uh, intellectuals uh, put too much importance on ideas because that's what they argue about for a living. Uh, and so there are a lot, particularly on the right, there are a lot of conservatives who treat ideas as if they drive everything and they're like, you know, they escape some East German lab and poison the minds of people or something like that. When in reality, things like the car did more to destabilize uh, uh, traditional families and communities than you know, any idea from Nietzsche or you know, Foucault or ever could. The problem is, is you can have an argument with Nietzsche, you can't argue with a Buick. <laughs> and so uh, intellectuals tend to have a bit of a blind spot about the role of technology generally. Um, I think that the way we raise kids today is particularly challenged by the role of social media. Uh, I was saying to somebody just before, you know, when I was a kid, you know, there were times you didn't get invited to a party. You didn't find out until Monday, you know? Now they're being like live streamed, and that sense of isolation and ostracism is really powerful. Um, I think the other problem, which gets to the political part, is that one of the problems with social media is it actually makes the entire country seem very small. And uh, people get very, very, very angry when they think people in their little community is living the wrong way. But, Things like Twitter and Facebook make the entire country seem like some small town. And when people start doing things that are fine for their community, it feels like it's happening in yours, and that creates a sense of resentment and anger and hostility. Um, uh, the other one, the societal one, is I mean, there are a lot of ways in which technology is affecting this. It used to be in this country, if you had a strong back and a good work ethic, and you were male, uh, your path to the middle class is all but a shoe. Um, I still think if you have a strong work ethic, uh, things will be okay for you, but it's gonna be harder. And um, we, have, our institutions, haven't figured out ways to deal with the fact that the traditional role for, for, for men, working class men in particular, is going away. A lot of the jobs of the future, are, I don't mean to be sexist about this, but they're better suited for women than they are for men in a lot of different ways. And our society hasn't had an honest conversation about that. And that is going to affect you guys uh, a lot in the future. So that's somewhat Last one, I guess? Yeah. Okay. That'd be awesome. Oh, here we go. All right, hi, I'm Lyle Leverett. Um, I'm from Christopher Newport University, um, one of the smaller ones. And um, my question has to do with one of actually our registration questions. I received an email right before I got here that asked, I think, about four questions. And one of them was whether or not I preferred Fox News or MSNBC. Um, and I live with my grandparents, so spent the summer watching PBS. Um, <laughs> yeah, some old West End Richmond folk. Um, oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so, watching all of that, um, I was wondering when I answered that question, I mean, I was, I definitely saw that there was, I mean, it was obviously divisive um, because I really prefer neither. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious as to if we do decide to be more in the middle to stay away from those partisanship, um, especially when it comes to media, what do we say to people? How do we say, you know, well, I'm not necessarily a liberal or a conservative, you know, I'm just a person. And um, especially because people do try to pick their sides that way. And I think that some of the tactics that are used on either side can be just downright useless. Mm -hmm. They don't solve the problem. All right, so full disclosure, uh, I am a Fox, I've been a Fox News contributor for 10 years. Uh, but because a part of my uh, Newfound appreciation for nuance. Uh, uh, I'm not on a lot of the opinion shows anymore, by which I mean I'm not on any of them anymore. And uh, which is fine by me. Uh, I'll still defend the news side of Fox News pretty strenuously, um, but I can't defend the opinion side of Fox News. I mean, that talk about monetizing dopamine. 
And I sort of can't defend a lot of the garbage that goes on in MSNBC. And so part of what I would say is, look, Sean Hannity, who I've known now for 20 years, uh, is the highest rated, uh, is the highest rated show in all of cable, cable news. Bully for him. Three and a half, great night for him is three and a half million people. That means on any given night, 229 million Americans aren't watching. And that same principle holds for all the other shows. Part of the problem, one of the reasons why our politics seems so much worse these days is that you used to have, and they were flawed, believe me, but these big media institutions that 60, 70% of the American people watched, got their news from, like Walter Cronkite and the CBS and the News. That's all been balkanized. And so instead what happened is you have a bit of these new business models that are trying to get as much money as possible out of the sticky one or two percent of the public rather than get a little money from 50% of the public. And what ends up happening is these outlets start telling their audiences what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And that is a problem across the ideological spectrum. And so one of the things I would say is, first of all, just don't get your news from TV. TV is an entertainment medium. Uh, I used to be a television producer. I've been on cable television stuff. I've been doing cable television news for 20 years. I used to be at CNN. It's fine if you're a political junkie and you want you know, to watch the carnival stalls of the culture yell at each other. But it's not that you actually get meaningful knowledge or information. And, uh, and I, I, I'm not damning television for that. It's just, it's an entertainment piece. It always has been and always will be. Um, and even for PBS, I mean, the PBS News Hour, which does very nice stuff, it really helps you fall asleep. Um, <laughs> but a big part of their audience are people who want to be the kind of people who say they only watch PBS. Right? There's a certain amount of virtue signaling there, too. And, uh, uh, and that's fine. It's a diverse country. But I think you should... It's a form of personal moral leadership to just simply say, I'm not choosing sides in any of that stuff. That's not me, right? I mean, a lot of the challenges we have in this country is this big sort where people are going off into their cocoons and they're not dealing with people that they disagree with. And it's something that I'm really trying to rebel. I feel partly responsible for how we got here. I made some contributions in that regard. And I'm doing penance by trying to like say I'm no more. And, um, uh, but the way you talk to people is be decent, have good manners, find a disagreement. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time for the last 20 years talking to young groups of conservatives on college campuses. I've probably been to 100, 120 college campuses. And often I'll talk to like the young Republicans and I always have to tell them, just because being a jerk is politically incorrect is not an excuse to be a jerk. Like, don't be a jackass is like the weirdest advice that I have to give to people all the time. And, um, and so go your own way. That's absolutely fine. And if, you, if people look at you funny because you don't watch MSNBC or Fox or, or I guess I used to watch CNN, um, that's fine. Let them look at you funny. You know, this is supposed to be a country where you get to figure out who you are. And if you don't want to be defined by that stuff, don't be, and don't let other people define you, define you by it. I, mean, I don't know what else to say. Anyway, thank you all very much.